My name is Brenda, and welcome to Horrifying History, where you will hear about the unexplained and supernatural happenings that have stained the pages of history. A shipwreck will always make for a good story. These tales usually come to the same ending, though, that the power of the sea is unstoppable. Shipwrecks have a level of mystery and wonder that's unmatched in other disaster-based tales, and in the end, they sit as ghosts of the past at the bottom of a body of water. They take on a new existence as graves, monuments, and mausoleums to the individuals who lost their lives on board. But some shipwrecks are more than that. So get comfortable, my spooky friends. You're about to hear the tale of shipwrecks that are said not just to be a snapshot in a fateful moment of time, but are also the home of something darker. For those of you who haven't heard our first story today, I expect that you'll likely think, Brenda, that can't be right. There is no way this is possible. But the scary thing is, it is. The SS Kamloops was a steamship that was built by the Furness Shipbuilding Company out of Durham, England, for Steamships Limited, that was based out of Montreal, Quebec in Canada. It was named for what is now the city of Kamloops, located in the province of British Columbia. And this city's name is the English translation of a Shuswap indigenous word that means where the rivers meet. It was considered to be a smaller vessel for the Great Lakes, being only 250 feet or 75 meters in length. It was specifically built to easily fit inside the lock systems within the Canadian-operated canals of the Lower Great Lakes and of the St. Lawrence River. After completing its sea testing on July 5, 1914, the SS Canloops was shipped to Denmark to pick up some freight, and then it sailed to Montreal, where it started taking freight between Canadian ports. While in service, the owners of the SS Kamloops were known to sail her very late in the season, but their desire for money came at a great risk. Crossing these waterways was quite dangerous, and many ships were lost in the Great Lakes due to storms and other accidents. It is currently estimated that there is over 6,000 shipwrecks in the Great Lakes that date back as early as the 17th century. Now, the primary reason that there are so many shipwrecks is due to the stormy weather, with late fall and early winter being particularly treacherous. According to the National Weather Service, it is not uncommon for powerful storms to move through the Great Lakes area. Cold Arctic air flows from the Rocky Mountains and across the Great Plains, and this collides with warmer and moist air from the Gulf of Mexico. These two weather streams often collide and create at times deadly conditions on the Great Lakes. This is why the owners of the SS Kamloops made a major mistake when they prioritized profit over safety. When the 1927 shipping season was coming to an end, the SS Kamloops was carrying machinery, food and building supplies on her last trip to go to Thunder Bay, Ontario. She moved through a set of locks to Lake Superior on December 4th, and then she anchored to wait out a storm. On December 5th, the captain decided to follow a larger bulk freighter ship across Lake Superior, but they were making very slow process since a second winter storm hit. Visibility was extremely poor as the temperatures dropped below zero Fahrenheit or minus 17.8 Celsius, lake-induced fog rolled in, and then high winds blew snow to make it almost impossible to see anything. The freighter ship was the last to see the SS Kamloops. Their crew would later claim that the SS Kamloops was completely covered in ice as she tried to fight her way through the storm. As the visibility dropped, they believed that the Kamloops was still behind them when on December 6th, they saw a landmass appear suddenly right in front of them. Having to make a very sharp turn to avoid disaster, they signaled the Canloops, who had no wireless communications. They presumed that the Canloops got the signal, but they didn't see the ship. The SS Canloops never made it to port. By December 12th, a search was called to try to find her and her crew. They decided to start in the area where the ship was last seen, the area of Isle Royale, But since it was very late in the season, search had to be suspended due to the heavy seas and the growing ice. 
they could not continue until the following spring. When the ice started to break up on Lake Superior, fishermen who were just off the coast of Isle Royale found two bodies that washed up onto shore. These bodies were identified as members of the SS Canloops crew. Then in early June of 1928, fishermen discovered six more dead on the island. Five of the bodies were huddled together trying to stay warm, and this included 22-year-old Alice Betteridge, who was one of the two stewardesses on board. A year after this, a trapper discovered a message in a bottle on the island. It read, I am the last one alive, freezing and starving to death on Isle Royale. I just want my mom and dad to know my fate. The message was then signed, Al, who is dead. It is believed that this note was written by young Alice Betteridge. All of this pointed to a horrendous fate for those six survivors of the SS Canloops. Much of the Isle Royale's shoreline is rocky cliffs, so to reach the island's interior, they would have had to climb ice-covered rocky cliffs to get to safety. But once on that island, they were far from safe. They would have faced gale-forced winds, temperatures that would have been about 38 Fahrenheit or 3.3 Celsius, and a remote and dangerous wilderness. After viewing the evidence that the survivors left behind, it is believed that they made their way to land via a lifeboat and remained fairly dry. Now this is because if they had to swim to shore, they would not have survived the night in the winter conditions. With no tools, shelter, a limited food and water supply, these survivors did not last for very long. Due to the fact that some of the ship's debris was found near the deceased on the island, it was believed that the wreck had to be close to this location. But searches found no sign of the Canloops, and for the next 50 years, the Canloops was considered to be one of the ghost ships of the Great Lakes, having sunk without a trace. But all of this changed on August 21st, 1977, when a group of sport divers found her while carrying out a systematic search for this ship. She is currently lying on the bottom of Lake Superior, under 260 feet or 79 meters of water on her starboard side at the base of an underwater cliff. She is on the northwest side of Isle Royale, near what is now known as Canloops Point. Some of the cargo that she was carrying that day is still sitting in her holds, while other cargo sits around the wreck site. But that's not the only thing inside this ship. She still contains human remains, and this is where we're getting into the hard-to-believe-but-true part of our story. The frigid fresh water of the Great Lakes creates an ideal climate for the preservation of shipwrecks, making this a scuba diver's dream. The cold water of the Great Lakes do not allow for bacteria to grow like it would in warmer water. The bacteria that would usually cause a dead body to float is kept at bay, and because of this, bodies can be preserved for years in the depths of Lake Superior that has water temperatures that linger around 34 Fahrenheit or 1 Celsius. Now concerning the cam loops, this resulted in everything being preserved, from the wooded steering wheel on the bridge to the flat of Lifesaver's candy that still sits in her hold. And then there's that guy that's still floating around this wreck's engine room. Yes, my spooky friends, you did hear this correctly. There is a deceased individual still floating in the engine room that is regularly seen by divers. He has been nicknamed Old Whitey, or Grandpa, and if you do a quick Google search, you can find photos and videos of this man in his watery grave. The reason that this poor soul is seen so easily, and why he's called Old Whitey, is due to a process that's called sopification, which occurs when a body remains in cold water. In this process, a human's body fat turns into a wax-like substance, which covers the body, and this happened in Old Whitey's situation. Now, that alone would freak me out, but that is not all that divers claim to see when they visit Old Whitey. Divers claim that they have seen him wandering throughout the ship, acting like he would have when he was alive, working, sleeping in his bunk, and sometimes just sitting back and watching the divers watch him. Now, even scarier, some have reported that Old Whitey follows divers as they swim through this wreck, and sometimes he reaches out to touch them. Those who have encountered him do have one thing to say about him, though, that Old Whitey means no harm. 
They believe that old Whitey is lonely down at the bottom of Lake Superior by himself, and he's just happy to have company in the freezing waters every once in a while. The RMS Roan was a British mail ship that was owned by the Royal Mail Steam Packet Company, and it was launched in 1865. During her time of building, the Admiralty Surveyor brought up some concerns about her bulkheads and her watertight compartments. Now revisions were made, and soon this ship was completed to his satisfaction. She was considered to be a very innovative ship for her time. She had a brass propeller, which was only the second made at this time, and a surface condenser that would reuse the water from her boilers and steam engine. No one expected that this ship would end up at the bottom of the ocean, since she proved to be strong as she weathered some severe storms. On October 19, 1867, the RMS Roan was docked on Peter Island in the Eastern Caribbean Sea before it had to go and pick up some coal. The ship's captain, Frederick Woolley, started to worry as the barometer dropped and dark clouds started to appear in the sky. But since it was October and he thought hurricane season was over with, he stayed put. And that was a mistake. The storm that would hit would later be classified as a Category 3 hurricane. Now the first part of this storm passed with very little damage, but the churning waters were causing the ship to drag. Captain Woolley started to worry that when the eye of the storm passed, that his ship may be driven ashore on Peter Island. The Roan was parked beside the RMS Conway, and due to the Roan was thought to be unsinkable, the Conway moved their passengers to the Roan. Now, my spooky friends, at this point of our tale, you're likely thinking that labeling a ship as unsinkable is just asking for disaster. And you would be right. The Conway decided to head towards another harbor, and the Roan decided to head out to open sea, which was normal practice at the time. Just to make sure the passengers were safe, they were tied down to their beds to prevent them from being injured in the stormy seas. Now, the Conway was able to escape, but the Roan, it got caught up at the tail end of the storm. It started to fill with water just off the south side of the British Virgin Island or Tortola, and it was stuck fast with its anchor, which got caught up in a coral head. The captain ordered for the anchor to be cut loose, and he thought that the best escape plan was to shelter in the open sea between Black Rock Point on Salt Island and Dead Chest Island. But just as this ship was passing Black Rock Point, the second half of the hurricane hit. The ship sank quickly, and of the approximate 145 crew and passengers on board, only 25 survived. What is left of the RMS Rhone is now considered to be a very popular dive site that is filled with aquatic life. But they are not the only things that are said to be staying there. It is reported that the souls of the individuals who died that day are still there in spirit form. Divers who have explored this easily accessible wreck claim to hear the sounds of human screams as they investigate this site. They also claim to feel the hands of the dead reaching out to touch them as they swim through this wreck. Now, personally, that is enough for me to not place this on my list of must-dive locations. The SS Alcamos was built in Baltimore, Maryland, as part of the United States Liberty Shipbuilding Program, and from day one, it is said that this ship was haunted. She was one of 2,751 Liberty ships that were built during World War II, but something occurred during the construction stage that didn't happen with the others. Several workers were unintentionally trapped in compartments that were riveted closed, and no one knew until the following day but it was too late. These workers had suffocated to death, but this didn't stop this ship from being launched on October 11th, 1943. But only a few days later, on October 20th, the ship was rechristened with the name of Viggo Hanstein. The ship was leased to the Norwegian Merchant Navy and was staffed by individuals of multiple nationalities as it completed support convoys across the Atlantic Ocean. With the deaths that occurred during the building stage and the name change, those on board started to believe that this ship was cursed when it constantly endured unexplained mechanical faults. 
Soon, people started to report paranormal activity on board, and they started to think that maybe these ghosts were what kept them safe as they were able to dodge U-boat torpedoes while their sister ships were hit and sunk. But that luck came to an end with a murder. Maud Stain was one of eight Canadian women who were killed in action during World War II, and the first woman from Toronto to die in service to her country. She was 28 years old at the time of her death, but how she died is up to debate. During the Second World War, Canadian women were not allowed to serve during combat, with the main argument being that this would result with women becoming promiscuous or that they would lose their femininity. When the Canadian Armed Forces began to recruit women in 1941, women started to answer the call to duty and they were ridiculed or shamed because of this. One of them was quoted to have said in part, My relatives viewed the uniform with absolute horror. Old family friends actually crossed the street rather than meet me in uniform. That was a very great hurt. A lot of men snickered behind their hands and a lot of mothers thought it was degrading. Now, this is why many women, just like Maud, decided to run away and join the Norwegian Merchant Fleet, which was docking in Toronto, Ontario, in Canada. The Norwegian merchant ships were the only Allied fleet that permitted women to serve, and this is how Maud came to serve on the SS Alkamos. After signing up to serve on the Alkamos in 1944, Maud became a radio operator on board while the ship was being used to transport gliders to Naples. She was on board for about six months when one day, the ship was unloading its cargo. It was then that Maud was allegedly shot by another crew member before he ended his own life. After hearing what happened, the Canadian government decided to say that she was killed by enemy fire, and Maud was classified as the first woman from Toronto to die in service to her country. Her body was laid to rest in Italy, but many believe she isn't actually at rest. This ship was sold in 1953 to Fargo Shipping, and in 1963, it struck a reef 4.97 miles or 8 kilometers from the western coast of Australia. It was salvaged and towed towards Fremantle, Australia, where it went for repair. When payment for these repairs were disputed, the ship left Fremantle by being towed by an ocean-going tugboat. Only a couple hours later, the tow line gave away. The Alkamos was then driven on shore and it couldn't be floated off. So as a quick fix, the ship was filled with water to make sure it would stay in place and it was left in charge of a caretaker. The following year, another tug came by to try to rescue this ship. It was successfully refloated, but just after the journey to the next stop was started, the Alkamos was seized by authorities and anchored once more. On May 2nd, 1964, the ship broke away from its anchor and it was driven onto the rocks at Alkamos, which is a coastal suburb of Perth, Australia. After it was determined that the ship's damage was just too great, it was sold for scrap, but the ship wasn't having that. In 1969, salvage workers were driven off this ship by fire and every time they returned, the same thing happened. It now sits as a ghost of its former self in this final resting place. This ship is said to be one of the most haunted ones in existence. From the time that the rumors started that construction workers were welded into this ship's plating during construction, the crew members who came and went through the years reported countless ghost sightings and terrifying supernatural encounters. Even when the attempts were being made to salvage this ship, these workers also reported hearing noises that did not make sense for this abandoned ship. It has been linked to strange injuries, disappearances, bizarre sightings, additional deaths, and even boats nearby to this wreck allegedly malfunction for unknown reasons. Some of the most common stories linked to this ship include how the ghosts of the workers sealed into this ship's walls have been constantly seen since their horrific deaths, and how a ghost puppy is often seen inside the engine room. People claim that they hear footsteps going up and down the ladders when no one is there, cooking smells and sounds come from the decommissioned kitchen, and kitchen tools are used by unseen hands and seen in action by the salvage crew. But as I said, there are some unexplainable tales attached to this ship. The first being that a pregnant woman worked aboard as a caretaker and how this ship took her baby from her after she suffered from a catastrophic fall. In another story, 
After investigating this ship, Arthur Jack Wong Su was hospitalized with an unknown respiratory illness. And the last has to do with a very famous long-distance swimmer who went by the nickname of Mr. Sharkbait. Herbert Voigt disappeared on March 15, 1969, when he attempted to swim to Rottnest Island across the Rottnest Channel off the coast of Western Australia. On that day, he passed on the offer to have a support boat and a crew with him. He strapped a knife to his outer right leg and he dove into the choppy, white-capped waters to start his swim. Now, even though people tried to dissuade him, he refused since he said he planned to make good on a bet he made. He was going to swim the 12 miles or 19.3 kilometers to Rottnest Island and get there in time to have lunch. But he never arrived. His skull was later discovered right near the SS Alkimos. One of the most famous shipwrecks in history is the RMS Titanic. This British ship from the White Star Line was built in Belfast, Ireland by Harland and Wolfe to make transatlantic passages between Southampton, England and New York City in the United States. It was advertised as the largest and most luxurious passenger ship of its time that was unsinkable. And it was large and luxurious, just not unsinkable. The Titanic set sail on its maiden voyage from Southampton on April 10, 1912, with 2,240 souls aboard. On April 15, 1912, the Titanic struck an iceberg in the early morning hours. It broke apart as it sank to the bottom of the ocean, taking more than 1,500 passengers and crew with it. Now, the exact location of the Titanic was lost for years, but after it was found, some salvage outside the major hull portion occurred. With that said, most of the ship still remains in its final resting place, which is approximately 12,000 feet or 3,657.6 meters below sea level, about 350 nautical miles off the coast of the province of Newfoundland in Canada. This ocean location has been the site of tales of the paranormal for years since the Titanic disaster. One of the first reports dates back to 1977 and to a ship that is called the SS Winterhaven. This ship was passing through this area when an officer on board named Leonard Bishop allegedly had a conversation with what who he thought was one of the ship's passengers. He gave this man a tour of his ship, and the look of intense interest of all the technology in the ship stuck with him. Now, many years after this event, Leonard saw a picture of the man that he showed around that day. It was the Titanic's captain, Captain Edward John Smith. Now, Leonard isn't the only one to report seeing the spirit of Captain Smith while sailing through this area. Many others have reported seeing the former captain walking the decks of their ships while in this area, but they also experience other strange events, which include seeing orbs covering the water on top of the Titanic resting site, having unexplained interference with their boat communication systems, and also receiving distress calls coming from unknown origins that include SOS and CQD, which means come quick danger. These both were used by the Titanic during her last moments. But the site of the Titanic is not the only location that is said to experience paranormal activity that's linked to this ship. As we mentioned previously, not all of the Titanic stayed at the bottom of the sea. Salvage companies have taken some artifacts from the bottom of the ocean floor and from the ship itself. According to the Washington Post, an organization called Titanic Ventures recovered approximately 1,800 artifacts in several dives that took place between 1987 and 1991, and some of these have gone out on tour. These artifacts are said to have some of the spirits from the ship attached, and one of these was said to be a survivor of the wreck. Frederick Fleet was the first to see the iceberg that hit the ship, and even though he survived, he later ended his own life. It is his spirit that is said to walk around the recreation of the promenade deck around artifacts that were pulled from the deep. But he isn't alone. A woman in period dress is often seen in this traveling exhibit staircase, and people often report being touched and hearing whispers of spirits that are still attached to these objects. And this is not an isolated incident. 
In the various collections of titanic items around the world, there are reports of people hearing strange noises or crying, feeling ghostly hands touch the living, and seeing the spirit of an elderly woman who apparently lives their afterlife in a replica cabin. With so many of the dead passing in such a traumatic and terrifying way, it should be a surprise to no one that these spirits of those who were on the Titanic on that cold April night are still here trying to tell us their stories. Thank you all for joining me for our latest episode of Horrifying History. Do you believe that the ships we spoke about today are haunted? Let us know what you think on Facebook at Horrifying History, on Instagram and threads at Horrifying underscore History, or on X at Horrifying H-I-S-T-1. Now, if you haven't done it yet, please remember to hit the subscribe button for our show. For when you do, not only do you let more people know about our podcast, but you download our next episode on its day of release. It's a great way not to miss our next episode, The Mystery of the Eight-Day Bride. If you'd love to take home a piece of horrifying history, you really should check out our store. You'll find some great items by going to redbubble.com and by searching for horrifying history in their search box. And if you want to get a bunch of amazing perks like ad-free episodes, free merchandise, additional episodes, and much more, join our fan club on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash horrifying history to sign up today. Thank you all for listening. And until next time.